what is the very first story or poem that you remember reading and what impact did it have on you as a writer? Okay, so um, so in like the person who taught me how to read was my dad. My dad did that and my dad is like, my dad worked as a teacher for some years and also as a, a school administrator. So he was always super um, committed and devoted to our educational lives at home. And so a lot of our education, our formal education happened at home. And so he decided that he was gonna be the one who was gonna teach me how to read. So my first experience reading happened with him. And I remember he used a picture book and I don't know how much of my memory of learning how to read is actual memory or if like I've fabricated a memory because my dad has told me the story so many times because he's so fucking excited that he taught me how to read. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so, I, so like I, I had the book for a very long time that he used to teach me and it was like a really cute book. It was called Nat the Rat. And it was a book about a rat that would go on these adventures. He was a pie rat. <laughs> and he was a thief. He was a really, really good thief. And he had like these little claws that he would use to steal things. And I really liked how he dressed. And, uh, and, uh, and I, wanted to, I wanted to continue like learning about, um, learning about his adventures. And so it was sort of this idea of adventure and vice that got me hooked on reading <laughs> through a criminal rat. Oh my God. <laughs> Is your dad still um, supporting you with, uh, with your writing endeavors? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They, they support me and they often will comment on, uh, they do something that I've noticed like that a lot of writers, friends and family will do, which is to say, you should write a book about blah. You know what I mean? And then they have these ideas of things that are their own personal obsessions and their own personal fascinations. And then they know that like, you have have the skill set or the talent in order to parlay their obsession into a book and so they're trying to feed you all these ideas and sort of pressure you into uh into into writing a novel for them so that's frequently like how my dad expresses his enthusiasm is he'll talk about a story that he's preoccupied with and then try to plant the seeds that that should be my next book in other words he tries to convince me that the things that he loves are actually the things i love <laughs> 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 do you yeah, often so take notes important. and you get inspiration from all this uh, ideas and stories from your family yeah yeah well my family we like to tell stories I think like my my ancestry is Mexican and Mexicans love to talk and Mexican <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we love our chisme and then we like to just we I mean in my family we we will get together and then, you know, the, the chairs get put into a circle and then everybody's just sort of thrown down with, with various stories. And I like that energy. I like that storytelling energy that I was raised with. And I try to bring that energy to the page. And <laughs> how did you come up with the idea for uh, your books, Mean, Painting Their Portraits in Winter and Dahlia Season? So the, um, so, all three of those books were not conceived of as books. They were all conceived of as other projects. So I'll go through them chronologically and talk a little bit about each one. So Dahlia Season was not conceived of, like I said, as a book. I had been writing various short stories. Um, and then I had like the kernels of a novella in progress and um, and then an editor asked me if I had any sort of manuscript that was like a full length manuscript for publication. And I mentioned to him that I could collect these various pieces that I had been working on and we could massage it and turn it into a full length manuscript. So that was how that grew from just this loose, loose sort of collection of experiments that I was engaging in to an actual manuscript. Then something very similar happened with painting their portraits in winter where again, I had been engaging in like what I considered to be sort of language experiments and story experiments. And I had really been, um, I had been quite taken with like um, folklore. And you can see like, if, if you've read it, there's like quite a bit of folklore that I've inherited from family and from ancestors that I 
used to sort of construct the story there. And it came about the ver in a very similar way where a publisher approached me and asked, like, do you have a book length manuscript? And I mentioned, oh, I have like these disparate things and we can put them together. And then lastly, Mean started as an experiment where I wanted to write about sexual assault experiences and I wanted to craft a narrative that addressed sexual assault, that described sexual assault, but that did it in a way that contrasted with um, emerging narratives, in particular narratives that I noticed uh, certain white women were writing. Um, I noticed that like uh, the popular narratives emerging were all sort of very solemn, very elegant, almost like religious in tone. And there wasn't much playfulness or spontaneity in the narratives themselves. Um, and I have often like a very sarcastic way of speaking. And I use, uh, I use humor to deflect and I also use humor in order to endure. And what I had noticed was a lot of literary representations of sexual assault made no room for that. They made no room for that sort of playfulness. Um, and they made little room also for the victim to demonstrate her humanity beyond her victimhood, you know what I mean? And to show mm -hmm. that sometimes she also victimizes people, not necessarily in the context of her own assault, but that the victim is a fully complex human being. And so I wanted to experiment with representing a character like that through myself. And then that wound up becoming a full length manuscript too. So. Uh, my next question, this kind of falls into uh, the fourth question that Kaylee is going to ask. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, in, uh, in your recent interviews about um, your view of uh, American Dirt, it's kind of um, obvious and you kind of discussed how um, enraged people were with things that you had written. And not that I want to get into it, but I wanted to ask, how do you have literary criticism and um, what advice would you give to upcoming writers of various backgrounds and individualities on handling this kind of criticism? Um, so the, the criticism, I, I've received different kinds of criticism. I've received, uh, like, I've had my work uh, critiqued by, by uh, reviewers in, like, different kinds of publications, uh, everywhere from, like, these, like, legacy publications of prestige like the New York Times and then uh, uh, local uh, local journals and small literary journals and, and and things of that nature and like it's it's it can be painful to a degree to to get a review that um, that is harsh feels harsh feels punishing um, or a review where, where you feel like, you know, the reviewer didn't get it, but is that my fault that the reviewer didn't get it? So did I fail at whatever sort of literary project I was, I was, uh, I was engaged in? Like, it does sort of make you feel like a momentary failure. Um, the pushback that I got for American Dirt differed from that type of criticism. So that type of criticism that I'm referring to as far as, like, if, that comes from book critics is launched at my work, right? But the pushback that I got for American Dirt was quite different. That pushback was framed morally and that didn't surprise me, but it was still disheartening um, because quite a few uh, writers, and these were particularly cisgendered, straight, white male writers uh, pushed back against me for what they considered uh, to be a moral threat that I posed, right? And the, and sort of like this moral breach that they thought that I had committed in critiquing what they frame as the sacred space of the imagination. And so these men were writing as if their imaginations are uncolonized, right? Their imaginations are this place where some sort of transcendence can occur, um, as if the imagination itself isn't socialized. 
And, uh, and so I was uh, going to pollute that sanctity by attempting to police their ability to imagine. And I wasn't surprised by that pivot because I've heard that pivot before, but, uh, but those critics, uh, I think intentionally missed the point of my criticism. And my criticism, I think, could easily be boiled down into like a two-pronged argument that not only do uh, Americans need to read in a socially responsible way, we also ought to write in a socially responsible way. There's no way that I can force you to do it, but through criticism, I'm going to scold you because that's what criticism is. Criticism is a scolding, right? And what writer is above a scolding? None of us are, because if we choose to write and we choose to publish, then we choose to be part of a community. And all literary communities, or all communities have certain levels of accountability and criticism is one way that accountability is exercised and measured. And so what I think that, 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 that those particular critics were asserting was that they are above accountability because they uh, are not, uh, they cannot be scolded. Mm. Which is so fucking stupid. It's like, no, we can yeah. all be scolded. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? it's, yeah. it's so interesting that you mentioned that because when I was researching the American Dirt scandal, I was on Goodreads and I was on Twitter looking at all the uh, negative talk. And most of them was, most of the, the talk uh, criticizing you. There were Anglo names. It was just really interesting to see that just that one group of people, you know, the majority of people that upset at you were, were white people. <laughs> yes, they're really, really angry. And we're yeah. surviving um, a pandemic that has brought like incredible global catastrophe and disaster. And in the midst of the crisis, I still have angry white readers writing me long emails about their feelings and I'm like fuck you like one of my theos wow. has coronavirus I'm self-isolating I've lost my job and I hurt your feelings by criticizing a thriller that it took you an hour to read and you're gonna pull a Karen on me right now you know what I mean <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> and it feels like like they don't even like they they haven't even read the full book like they i feel like it uh like just from the tone of the review that i've read there there's no real connection there it's just you're yeah. reading, reading it to get angry like yes. and, and at the wrong person exactly exactly um and then the other funny thing one of the other funny comebacks that some of the readers have addressed to me is 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 sort of framed this way um I read the book and I learned a lot from it. And because I learned a lot from it, Miriam, you're wrong. And I think to myself, you think that you learned a lot from it, but what you learned is wrong. You learned a misrepresentation because you don't know any better. You don't know the reality of this place and you don't know the, the sociological factors that, that underpin the plot of this novel. And so you've been misrepresented a people and a place and a problem, and you have nothing to compare it to. You have no accurate reference points. So you think you've been enlightened, but what you did was you ate garbage. <laughs> and if you think garbage tastes good, that's on you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I, and I liken it to like a food critic. If a food critic tells you don't eat that, you shouldn't eat it. You know what I mean? And a book critic is doing, a, is performing a similar function. We're telling you don't eat that. That's mierda. Like we know better. Like go eat this instead. <laughs> go eat this instead. Mm -hmm. So it's just ridiculous. Oh, I feel yeah. like a lot of it is doing it because they can, you know? Mm hmm and the frustrating part too that I was talking about with Kayla earlier was there was some parts in the book that just did not make sense like from a Mexican standpoint like are there any scenes in that book that stood out to you that made you go what really like what the heck was going on here yeah like um from the first page I thought to myself like this is so silly 
because the first chapter is just it's it's it, there's so much blood and so much violence and so much carnage in that first chapter it almost seems like a joke do you know what i mean like it's it, it's it's so over the top that it's like campy um and then that that introductory description of acapulco seemed so odd to me like i have not been to i've not been to acapulco but this notion of a backyard quinceanera for a middle class family was strange, right? Especially given that they're middle class and they're having a barbecue style cookout, which yes, like if you're if you're writing a story about a Chicano family or somebody who's on the borderlands, yes, that's gonna happen. It's not gonna happen in Acapulco. And then the funniest part was I think there was potato salad that they're eating at this quinceanera. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> the fuck, Pota like potato, like no, like this just, it just, it was, so, it was so off. You know what I mean? It was so off. And then I was reading um, a book by Luis Alberto Urrea, uh, where he details his experiences in Tijuana I'm working with impoverished folk who live in a dump and they scavenge at the dump and there's a celebration at the dump and there is a barbecue cookout and a potato salad being eaten. And one of the authors that uh, Common says that she used to research Mexican life is Urrea. And I wonder if she didn't harvest these details from his books, which are centered along the border. So there's sort of like these border expressions of life that are quite different than life in Mexico or life in Central America, of course. And then sprinkle them throughout her book, thinking that nobody was going to notice where she had grabbed, you know, these references from. But I do think that that's what she did is she went to Luisa's work grabbed what she could and thought nobody would notice <laughs> oh my god <laughs> has, I, has he come out and said anything about this he has so mariano Rosa from npr latino i um, did like an hour-long radio special on the controversy and she interviewed the author janine cummins she interviewed sandra cisneros because she blurbed the book and hyped the book. She interviewed me, and then she also interviewed Luis. And Luis did address um, the accusations of plagiarism and, and described the heartbreak that, that he felt when he encountered um, certain passages that were very, very, very similar to passages he had written 10, 15 years ago. Wow. Yeah. That sucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you're working so hard to create something and then just somebody comes and paraphrases it or steals it. it yes, that she paraphrased it and then thanked him in her acknowledgments. And it's like, wow, you're going to take something and then thank somebody for the thing you took. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> That's ugly, you know? Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. One, well, another getting, question. Getting back. Oh yeah, Katie. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> no, it's cool. Oh, I was gonna say, um, getting back to um, when I asked about your your criticism about American Dirt, I wanted to ask um, to counter that. What what is the best compliment that you've ever received from for your literary work? Oh, the best compliment I've ever received from my literary work. Oh my God. Okay, so so. <laughs> So this is one of my favorite things ever. And it's not like this rave review that I got in some publication. It was, it was a totally backhanded compliment. So like some writers are a little bit masochistic and we'll go on sites like Goodread or Amazon and we'll read our reviews, right? That are posted by regular readers, right? And like, those things can be so fucking mean. They can be so mean. And um, 
So I, I, I was going through my Goodreads reviews one time for me and I'm all with cheese muscle. I want to see what, what kind of shit people are talking. So I go on there and then I find this long one by this woman who's like, you know, I was reading the book, I was reading Mean and, you know, I thought that the author had suffered a lot because she experienced sexual assault and I was finding it very difficult to deal with her personality as a narrator because she just seemed like a very mean catty person and then I just I don't know why but I googled her and she's really pretty she's too pretty for me to sympathize with I hate the book and I was like oh I'm too pretty (laughs) how did that how did that feel like were you like and then like kind of like oh what (laughs) on the one hand it was like what a fucked up thing to write like uh, how like how minimal is your awareness of how you're gonna come off like an asshole you know what I mean if you put something like that in public (laughs) and not only about anybody but somebody who survived like kind of a gnarly sexual assault well she's too pretty to be this angry and it's like there are so many layers to dissect in that review. I kind of want to write an essay just about that because there's so much happening. Do you know what I mean? So much happening. It made me laugh. It made me a little sick to my stomach, but at the same time, I was laughing because it was so absurd. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that took some balls, like some stupid balls to put in public, you know? <laughs> <laughs> It's like some people have too much free time on their hands. <laughs> exactly, 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 exactly. Uh, another question that we have is, how did you first break into publishing? And what were some of the setbacks that you faced in having your work published? And what were they? That's, that's a good question. And like, I'm not sure what my point of entry was, because I think that what I did in like my 20s was I would sort of open the door to publishing look around and then close it and then open the door and look around and close it you know what I mean um kind of like you know when you're gonna take a shower and you keep feeling it you know what I mean to see if it's hot enough like I don't know if I'm ready to jump in yet so I had moments like that for example one of those moments was in the early 2000s I worked as an editorial assistant for two different lesbian magazines and that was like sort of my entry into the publishing world you know what I mean but because these were really small magazines and one of them was pornographic it felt like I wasn't even going in the back door of the publishing world I was going in through the sewers (laughs) (laughs) going through the sewers like a rat um and then uh I first started to publish my own work um work that hadn't been assigned by those magazines because I did some work that was assigned by those magazines I did some some writing work um online so I started to publish in like very small literary journals in particular ones that had some type of like queer bent um and that are no longer around. Like a lot of those early places where I published are now defunct. So that was my, I would say that was more my entry was through those defunct small queer spaces. Oh, and what were some of your favorite or least favorite parts about the publishing journey? Some of the best and the worst uh, memories? Uh, some of my best and worst memories. Um. I've had, let's see, I've had some funny moments that were kind of uh, frustrating as well. Um, for example, I had, I had one publisher who was very unenthusiastic about my work and reluctant to promote it and who would say really disparaging things to me about my work and my audience. Um, and she did something that pissed me off with my first book, which was we were choosing covers, right? And sometimes authors have input into their covers and sometimes it's just done for you. In this case, I was shown like a series of images and asked for my input as far as the cover went. And 
uh, Dahlia season is like a collection of short stories and thematically the stories are held together by character because the, most of the characters are um, uh, Chicanas or Chicanx people, but they're all living in like urban settings. So I get this potential cover and it's of an Adobe house. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay. Oh, okay. The stories are set in urban California. There are no Adobe, and it was like an Adobe, like in a rural place that looked like the Southwest, and it looked like a this was a very indigenized image, which didn't correspond to anything in the stories. I think it was just intended to signal Mexicans, you know what I mean? <laughs> And so it was really, really frustrating. And I wanted to lash out against the publisher, but I also didn't want to anger her to the point where she would withdraw my contract or do something to sort of undermine my success. So there have been like instances like that that have been hard to navigate where somebody will pull some homophobic or racist bullshit on you and you're like, okay, how do I address this? And then walk the tightrope so that I can also carry on with some semblance of a literary career. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I was going to ask, um, we know that you're familiar with our own professor, um, Dr. Carmona, um, and I wanted to ask, what, what other authors um, do you find yourself confiding in, and how have they helped you um, become a better writer? Authors who I find myself confiding in? Yes. Uh, as in, like, they're my people, they're my friends. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I'm in, like, correspondence with a lot of writers. I write to a lot of writers. I like writing to people. Um, I email back and forth with various writers. Um, uh, and then I have friendships with people in real life um, in, like, the L.A., in the LA area, although the pandemic has prevented me from being able to see like people in my writing writing sphere, um, two uh, friends who are like just heart meltingly supportive and who are just women that I I love 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 are Mari Naomi. I um I do a podcast with her. And she and I met on tour. We toured um, uh, our books through Sister Spit, Sister Spit, which used to be like a traveling queer uh, literary roadshow. So we, we were involved in that one year and, and we became like, we clicked and, and, and like this the, the lifelong friendship uh, was inspired by the time that we spent on the road together. So she's somebody who uh, matters a lot to me. And then another writer who um, who has always had my back and I have hers is Wendy Ortiz. Um, she, uh, Mari's a cartoonist and a graphic novelist. Wendy um, is a writer um, and she writes across genres. She writes essays, uh, she's written memoir. Um, and she's also written poetry. And like one of her um, most experimental works was a book called Bruja, which is um, a memoir told through dreams. So she recorded her dreams for approximately a year and then constructed uh, a memoir using those dreams. So you get to travel through her dream life, uh, which is incredibly strange, but rich. Yeah. So those two, I love those wow. two a lot. That sounds really interesting. Can you also tell us a little more about the uh, podcast you mentioned? Sure. So, um, so Ma it, Mari came up with the idea for it, and it is an advice-driven podcast. So, um, listeners write to us with questions, soliciting advice. Um, we don't always give good advice, but we give it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then uh, we pair that often with a guest, and we have different kinds of guests. So often our guests are fellow writers or fellow cartoonists, um, for example. And then we, have, we also have, yeah, like I said, writers, cartoonists, artists, activists. Um, so we guested Runda Girard, 
who is a uh, Palestinian American writer. Um, we guested uh, Antonio Crane, who's uh, a white American writer and um, a sex work organizer. So those are the kinds of folks who will host. And we are going to be um, reviving the podcast and we're gonna be um, uh, hosting an episode through Instagram Live next week. Oh, that's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for telling us about it. Themes? Yeah, my do pleasure. Do you carry themes with your, with your podcast? Say that again? I said, do you carry themes like every week with your podcast? Oh, or um, is it just random? That's, yeah, so we will try to sort of craft it thematically. Often the questions will guide us thematically. So people will send us questions and for whatever reason, the questions will tend to sort of cluster into various categories. And if that's the case, then we'll sort of shake the podcast around that. For example, we'll get maybe a question about polyamory um, and then a question about dog sitting. And we're like, okay, these two don't necessarily, <laughs> um, we, can't, we can't necessarily reconcile these. So we're going we're gonna to let the, the, the questions pile up so that we can then sort them thematically and then devote maybe like an entire episode to relationships and then we're going to put the polyamory there and then save the dogs for, <laughs> save the dogs for something else. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> then this is all on YouTube, you said, or? Uh... This is through, so the podcast was through iTunes. It's available through iTunes, iTunes. but because we are social distancing, like we live near each other actually, but we're social distancing. We're gonna do our next podcast through Instagram Live. So we're gonna invite people to, to join us that way. And that'll be next week. And I'll promote it through my Instagram. I know that you, you, you talked to us a little bit about your books um, and I wanted to ask uh, which of your books or characters did you find most enjoyable for you to write or most fascinating? Oh, okay. Which character has been most enjoyable or fascinating? Um, there was um, there was a character that I wrote, and she's in painting their portraits in winter. She doesn't have a name, but it's because she has amnesia. She can't remember her name, and she's an amnesiac ghost. Um, who only knows that she's dead and Mexican, that's it. And she like emerges from this forest with that knowledge and that's sort of the only knowledge that she has guiding her. And then on occasion, she'll remember bits and pieces um, or be able to like identify things that exist in the world of the living, but she's not sure how it is that she knows those things. Um, so like the story is like a meditation on on relation, relating, relating as a living person, relating as a dead person, um, uh, how it is that we know what we know. Um, but it was, it was, it was fun writing that character um, because it was fun writing from invisibility because she was invisible too. And like, that is, um, that's like one of the, the properties that I fantasized about before. Like I remember there was, a, um, there was, I think it was um, on This American Life, there was a story segment once on superpowers and people were invited to choose between one or the other. It was, would you rather be able to fly or become invisible? And I always thought flight was stupid. Like, why would you want to fly around? Like, you'd fly into birds. Like, it just... <laughs> all fly, we'd just be crashing into each other. Like, it just seems dumb. And, like, you get bugs in your teeth. Like, I don't know. So, like, <laughs> just, yeah. dumb. so I automatically am, like, team invisible. Duh. Like, think of all the gossip that you... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all the cheese man, like... <laughs> like all the fun you could have being invisible and so that's like a thing for me is to, to, like, I enjoy thinking through fantasies of invisibility but also sort of like the dark side of invisibility fascinates me and so I was able to entertain that fascination through that amnesiac character that was mm -hmm. really, really fun 
Yeah. And what inspired that uh, character? Is there like a person or an event that inspired it? Um, I had wanted to write about ghosts. And um, I was inspired by the novel Pedro Paramo, which is told from the perspective of the dead. So every narrator in that novel is dead, but not all of the narrators understand that they're dead. Um, and most of the narrators are masculine and uh, none of the narrators are children. And so I wanted to write from the position of like a really marginalized ghost, a really young ghost, but also a confused ghost. And then I also wanted to bring humor into the idea of a ghost. You know what I mean? Like often, like when you enter into a story with a ghost, there's like an element of horror. Um, but the element of horror in her case wasn't so much that she was dead. She was fine being dead. It's not knowing who she is that's really bothersome to her and not knowing who she died. That's what's bothersome. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and then the other thing that like made her interesting to me was like her aloneness and her solitude because like she's, she's, she seems to be like a young woman, like maybe 13, 14, 15, but she's utterly alone. And like, that's a time in a person's life when typically we want to be in community with other people our age, but not only is she not, she's also dead. <laughs> so I don't know. I was, I had fun writing, writing about her. I wish I could write about, I, I'd like to write about more ghosts. I feel like ghosts are underappreciated. Totally. Well. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I love ghosts. I love writing about ghosts. I love art that features ghosts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what kind of books do you find yourself reading lately in your spare time? Okay, so I don't want to read anything having to do, like, I don't want to read books that sort of reflect our current reality. Some people are doing that. Like, I noticed that some people were like, oh, they want to watch like pandemic themed shows or disaster themed shows. I don't want that. Like, I don't, I don't want to see disaster or catastrophe on mass or large scale. Um, I am reading uh, quite a bit about race. I'm always reading a lot about race. Um, and I'm doing research for various like writing projects that I'm working on. Um, the book that I'm reading, I'm about three quarters of the way through at the moment, is um, uh, it's called Minor Feelings by Kathy Park Hong. And it's a collection of essays about um, relating as an Asian American. Um, but Kathy is a poet. So she brings sort of a poetic voice and a poetic sensibility to an exploration of Asian American life, um, in particular, like uh, Asian American experiences of race. And it's super good. It's super, super good. And it centers California. And I love reading about California because that's where I'm from. So I really like uh, being given back the state that I live in but projected through a new lens or through a new prism, a prism that I can't access because I'm not Asian, you know what I mean? So I always appreciate uh, being given like those glasses. Mm -hmm. What kind of projects are you working on now that we're in quarantine? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I am doing uh, writing for different outlets. Um, so writing that is somewhat journalistic um, and then I'm also uh, I going to shop and try to sell a sequel to Mean um, that is going to, the way that I'm conceiving of it right now is it's going to detail um, what I was experiencing as I wrote Mean. So in some senses, it's going to be a book about writing a book. Um, which might sound really boring, <laughs> but the premise is this, that like, as I was writing Mean, 
I'm writing a book about a sexual assault that I experienced in 1996, like one that had really, really, really dramatic and dark consequences. But as I was writing that book, I was surviving domestic violence. Um, I was like in my first heterosexual relationship after having gotten out of like a 15 year lesbian marriage. And so I was very, very, very trapped in that situation. Um, and, uh, and I'm in this unique position to compare the experience of a stranger assault with assaults perpetrated by somebody who I knew and trusted. And like, there's a sort of folklore that's emerged in the United States surrounding the serial killer. And the man who sexually assaulted me in 1996 was a very young serial killer. That's what he was on his way to becoming, right? He was caught when he was attempting to kidnap his second victim. Um, and so, and so I'm in this unique position to contrast what it's like to be assaulted by a serial killer versus a batterer who is involved in domestic violence. And I want to debunk that idea of the serial killer as this arch villain because domestic, my experience with domestic violence was actually worse. <laughs> it was a lot worse. And it's much more common. Like one in four women are going to go through it. And it's worse than being chased by a serial killer. And I think that that is widely misunderstood. I think that the experience of domestic violence is widely misunderstood. That, and I think what's most misunderstood about it is that at its core, it's not an experience of being painfully harmed through physical assaults. That's one of the methods employed by a batter. At its core, you're being held captive by somebody who doesn't want you to leave. That's really what's going on. So what I wanna do is write about that state of captivity as I was writing a book. That's sort of the, the thrust behind that, that sequel. Wow, that does not sound boring at all. <laughs> I am really looking forward to reading that when you, Thank you get it published. We'll check it out. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming again to this interview and rescheduling and all that stuff. My pleasure. So that's the last of the questions that we have. Is there anything that you would like to share with uh, our viewers? something that other people might not uh, know about you that you'd like to share about yourself? Um, okay, I'll share one thing. My middle name is made up. My parents invented it. So like people will try to guess what like language it's in or where it's from and they will go hard and I'm like, no, you're all wrong. It's made up. So, <laughs> so that's like a fun fact is that like my middle name is is a fraud. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, is it, can we know the, na the middle name? Yeah, I'll spell it for you because it's a weird ass name. <laughs> K-I-P-I-E-L-K-A. -E exactly. Wow. <laughs> it's a weird name. People often guess that it's Polynesian and I'm like, no, it's made up Asian. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it, your name really suits you, so I really Thank like you. it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam. I hope you have a nice uh, rest of the week. I hope that you do, too. Thank you, and take care and stay safe. Thank uh, there's, you. They're saying that there's going to be a second wave of the coronavirus mm -hmm. in the fall, so, uh, you know, just uh, take care. <laughs> you as well. Good luck with the review, and good luck with school. Thank okay. You. Bye.